be first, let's now. And then you have to unmute, okay? Great, and thank you so much for praying. I've, I've had a text from uh, Singapore just now, a couple of seconds ago, saying they're going to try and rearrange the dates. I will have to uh, ring Singapore immigration to see if how soon they would allow me to go in. I'll do that as well, probably later this evening. Well, <clears throat> great to be with you tonight. I'm going to turn to the subject of the Word of God, the Bible, the Word of God. Um, and uh, I want to talk about uh, what the Word of God is and how we read it and various things like this. <clears throat> Just this morning, I think Vicky was sent a link um it was you sent it by pete and bev jones that uh, masada in israel this this place where the the jews uh withdrew to the palace of herod in, in near the dead sea that uh, 2000 years ago they the whole site was abandoned and recently the archaeologists have found seeds and they found one seed particularly that was of an extinct fig tree was it date, date tree date palm and it was extinct and is, is not not seen at the moment it's obviously a variety it's completely extinct and this archaeologist one person took it aside and um, managed to germinated with water and uh, to their great surprise it grew and this this tree this extinct tree has come back to life it really hit me as, as i was thinking about it that when you see a, a little seed in your hand that is 2000 years old there is no intrinsic difference to look at it than um, than something else that like sand or something or wood chips it's just and even though it's 2000 years old there is the mystery that that seed has life in itself and and it, there's a huge difference between life and non-life and what I can't grasp, I don't know if anybody can, uh, I don't know if there's any, I'm sure there are some scientists can say something more about it than I can, but even when you can say everything, the difference between life and non-life is so amazing. And to think of a seed having life for 2,000 years and lying in that dry and dusty place, and then by the coming of water, it springs to life. Now, of course, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the word of God. And the words of men have no life. There's no life in the words of men. When you, if you were to read Hansard, you know, the, the, uh, the written account of everything that's said in the House of Commons, I don't know if anybody actually does read it. I'm sure some people refer to it to see what they actually said and what was actually said. But when you think about it, those vast volumes of words about positions and different ideas and money invested they're all dead they're lifeless words but then we come to the word of god and the word of god in its different forms the great mark of it is that it has life and of course, going back right to the first word that God spoke in the beginning, uh, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And so it goes on. But that word of God, that original word of God in the beginning, was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and yesterday we were talking about sowing to the spirit and i said that studying the bible 
is not sowing to the spirit and of course that's that's because really sowing to the spirit is much more to do with love and kindness which is the if you like the life of the word the 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 word begets life and therefore love and if we are to turn the word of god into dry study which is possible jesus said you you study you 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 study the word for in them you think you have eternal life but you will not come to me who am the living word and this is the whole point we need to have a, an understanding that both the original word of god has the power to give life to whoever receives it in the right way but all the words of god in their different form have the power to become life to us if we will let them enter our hearts and allow the holy spirit to germinate them now we live in a day when um bible reading is at a low ebb now the bible is certainly produced in vast quantities more than now than ever before i've got this uh, lovely truth i check this out quite a bit because if you go online you'll find it disputed but apparently voltaire said um it, it, some back way back in the 90 in the 1750s i think it was some you know 300 years ago he said that within 50 years of his lifetime or 100 years there would not be any more bibles in the world and his house in paris i i did some research in this because he had several houses one was in geneva where he lived in exile one was in paris but the one in paris later became a depot for the bible society and it was within about a hundred years after he said that it wasn't that the bible had disappeared his house was filled from cellar to attic with bibles <laughs> and i thought oh lord you've got such an amazing sense of humor but also you've got this tremendous ability to show the world if only you know i do think that the truth of god is not always on the surface it needs a bit of looking and uh, i think we can agree that the bible has tremendous depths as i've been reading and studying genesis again i've uh, you know for our sunday mornings that i've been doing i've been hit by things that i've seen in those in those pages that i didn't ever see before and I want to keep reading the scripture with that freshness of openness of heart to allow it to speak. And so we live in a day when the Bible may be being published and printed, but in so many places, the Bible is being neglected. Now, back in the um, time of Voltaire, when Voltaire said that he was in the age of rationalism and the age of reason as they called it which was what was happening was reason was displacing all faith in god and uh, got various things happening but th that was that was bad enough but the thing is that then it after voltaire said what he said it, he was wrong but within a hundred years there were theologians in germany and different parts of the world who were beginning to discount discount the miraculous nature of the bible and uh, there was one famous german theologian who said i have delivered the church from having to believe in any miracle in the bible it's just stories what a nonsense that was but you see rationalism had entered into the church into the bible studies into examining the word with our reason and ironing out putting out the supernatural in other words making the bible lifeless robbing it of life the age of reason 
is giving way to another age. So we still have that, that basic philosophy that we must be rational, scientific, and we must believe in the, um, in the whole thing of uh, science. Science is the one that has the truth. Of course, this isn't, this isn't true at all. Science cannot explain what, what life is. I just said, what is the difference between life and non-life? Science can't explain how it rose. Uh, there is a huge missing link between non-life and life, but they can't even explain what life is, let alone human life and thinking life. But though that is a huge problem, there is another problem that has come up nowadays, which is that truth in a moral world comes not through the, through, through the, the mind even, but through the exercise of will and choice so that there are we are we're robbing the world of absolutes and there's no right or wrong and we know we discover what we we, we feel about a thing not from an absolute authority but from um from discussion which is one of the reasons that <clears throat> When we look at people's attitudes to say homosexuality, um, this the big question is not what I think about it, what do people think about it? The question is, what does God think about things? What does God say about things? Somebody asked me what I think about the LGBT movement, and I said, well, it doesn't really matter what I think. The only big question I have is, is the Bible the revealed word of God? If it is, then the question now is not what do I think about anything, but the question is, what does the Bible say about things? Now, um, so we've got these two things. One is rationalism, which is trying to analyze everything and explain away miracles. And the other is what we could call existentialism, relativism, it's all kind of our world in which everything is now a discussion and an opinion. And we all create our own world. We all will create our own heaven. We all create our own hell. So there is no more heaven. There is no more hell. And the, the, the whole thing that you find that is, 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 is slowly developing and it's affecting the church is people are beginning to say, well, maybe the Bible isn't right on this subject of how. Maybe the Bible isn't right on the subject of LGBT and so on. Now, um, what you have as a result is a church without a compass, a church without direction, a church without roots. And you can see this throughout the British Isles, Recently, the Methodist Church voted on, um, I think it was uh, same-sex marriage. I can't remember what the vote was on, but 65% of the Methodists voted in favor of it, thereby putting their vote over the word of God. Um, this has another side to it, in that if opinions and subjective feelings are more important, then dreams, visions, words from angels carry a lot of weight. And you go to some charismatic churches and movements. Um, I remember this actually with Samuel Doctorin, a man of God that I greatly respected and preached amongst us. But his vision of angels, um, he, he claimed it was a real vision, and I have no reason to disputed but i personally could not embrace that as authoritative and place it alongside the word of god and i i had to draw back from that now i'm not saying whether i'm, I'm right or wrong but i believe that the point is that i test it not by what i feel angels this is impressive no i test it by the word of god and if it doesn't fall in line with the word of God, then I am under no obligation to receive it. But you see, <clears throat> what we're talking about is the danger of false prophecy. 
and prophets can prophesy their own imagination and and then we have chaos in the church and you have this on some extreme ends of the charismatic movement you have books written whereby angels are quoted and even demons are quoted i remember there's a book by a woman named rebecca brown which is full of quotes by demons about the whole ministry of how to set people free from from bondage and uh, uh, there's no way you can trust what those demons are saying but neither is it true that you can believe what angels are saying to people you have to test everything by the word of god alec motir spoke at the summer conference about uh, 20 years ago now i think it was alec motir this great uh, evangelical theologian bible school ahead and so on he said that in his many years he was already in his 60s i think when he came to the conference he said that in his many many years teaching in bible school every new intake of bible students knew the bible less than the previous generation <clears throat> here's a couple of quotes from the uh, <coughs> here's one of my favorites smith wigglesworth said this god's word is supernatural in origin eternal in duration inexpressible in valor that's a <laughs> one way of describing it infinite in scope regenerative in power infallible in authority universal in application inspired in totality read it through write it down pray it in work it out pass it on the word of god changes a man until he becomes an epistle of god i think there's no doubt in my mind why smith wigglesworth was such a man of faith part of it was his relationship with the bible he didn't just read it but he believed it and staked his all on it and uh, sometimes we believe it but we don't stake our all on it we we hang back and uh, anyway that's what he did uh, i believe that he, he 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 soaked in the bible it's true that he was illiterate when he became a christian he couldn't read he learned to read through reading the new testament and he virtually learned it off by heart he was a man of one book i'm not saying that's always a virtue sometimes we need to read what other christians have said and get a better perspective but in his case a simple soul with a single minded call on his life he soaked in the new testament the same is true of george miller who read the bible five times a year for about 60 years i think he read the bible 300 times in his lifetime and he was just a setting for that simple word of life he believed it and he said one of his testimonies was that when he it was an old man he said i've god has never uh, not answered any of my prayers what an astonishing thing to say um but uh, i'm sure it was all due, due to his relationship with the bible now <clears throat> the there's an interesting um point i mean when when billy graham was a young man he got he got um he had a friend named charles templeton and charles templeton was very tempted by liberal rational rationalist thinking about the bible and uh, charles templeton affected billy graham and they were both believers and they were both evangelists as young men quite powerful evangelists both of them but charles templeton became very infected by rationalist theology and billy graham had this conflict and he took the bible one day went out as it happens in the woods not that that was a virtuous thing in itself but he went out into the woods found a tree stump put the bible on the tree stump 
knelt beside it. And he made a conscious choice and prayer. He said, I surrender myself to the authority of this word in its entirety. I believe it, I embrace it, I surrender to it. And he said that his, word, his life changed from that moment on and his ministry changed. And he would quote the Bible, believing in its power. I believe there's power in the quotation of the scripture. And I believe that's why we preach the scripture. Charles Templeton, who had a, a similar ministry to Billy Graham, drifted away through rationalism. And about 30 years later, in his 50s, he wrote a book called Farewell to God. And he turned his back on God completely. That was what he wrote, a book called farewell to God and by leaving the word he'd shut off his soul from from God from the access of the Holy Spirit now the point is that the Bible says of itself that it is inspired by the Holy Spirit you can read this these are famous verses in in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 it says this <clears throat> let me read it to you <coughs> let me read a bit earlier from childhood timothy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in christ jesus all scripture is God breathed. What a word. All scripture is God breathed, given by inspiration, which is breath of God. All scripture is God breathed, and all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then also in, 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 uh, one, in Second Tim Peter, he says that knowing this, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man. True prophecy, of course, he's referring to. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So when you think that in the beginning God spoke and created the world we live in, and created the things around us, we know that the world we live in is a manifestation of the word of God. But we also know that God has caused it to be written in a book. This is what John Wesley said, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. How to land safely on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach the way. For this very end he came from heaven. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. Billy Graham said, the word of God hidden in the heart is a stubborn voice to suppress. Now, when we look at the Bible, we, we know that um, it is supernatural, even in the way it's preserved. If you think about it, if, I, if we had Chinese whispers, if we had Chinese whispers, and you know how Chinese whispers, when people say something, then it's passed on and it's passed on and so on, passed on, and then you find that it's, it's so different. And that's the truth of the manuscripts of worldly literature. You can have uh, a dozen manuscripts of things like Homer's Iliad and uh, Virgil's Aeneid and these different books and Julius Caesar's writings. You can have various manuscripts and they're copied down and, be and they, they, they become very different. 
But when you look at the manuscripts that are the foundation of the scriptures that we have in our hands, there are 24,000 manuscripts. This is huge. And when you look at them, they, they are scattered over the, 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 the Middle East and the Mediterranean, Europe, different parts. You find these manuscripts. So they are separated in their um, copyist traditions by thousands of miles, hundreds of years. But when you actually then compare them, it is astonishing that they all point back to one common root. They are not different in any significant way. So we know that what we have is what, in Genesis, Moses wrote. We know that we have what Paul wrote. We know that we have, we know absolutely certain, we don't know that we have what, Homer wrote and Julius Caesar, we're not sure. But we know we have what these men of God wrote. And so um, we could, we could, here's, here's a quote from a man named Sir Frederick Kenyon. He said, The last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us as they were written now has been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the New Testament and of the whole Bible may now be regarded as firmly established. And there's more quotes we could give, but the point is the Bible is supernatural. Now, why am I saying all these things? It's to refresh in us the belief that one of the great blessings that cannot be measured is the bible it's it's our gift from god and it's inspired by the holy spirit preserved by the action of god through history the bible is a supernatural book of course it's we uh, let me read another one it is uh, this is by a man named simon greenleaf he said the resurrection of jesus christ is one of the best established events of history according to the laws of legal evidence administered in the courts of justice. And you could multiply these quotes. Here's another one. I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible is not a book of beliefs. It's a book of events, of actions, of things that happened. And um, anyway, we could, we could go on and on about those with quotations like that. The Bible is amazing. And uh, we could now look different aspects of this. One is the, the prophecies in the Bible. I'm not going to go on a long list of prophecies. We'll do that. I'm sure on other subjects as well. But the point is, the Bible is a book of prophecy. And it prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. That he would be born of the tribe of Judah. That he would be crucified. That his death would be redemptive. And, and all these different things we could go on, and he was born of a virgin and so on. We could do this. Daniel prophesied the year he would die. And we could go on and on with it. The, the, there's so many prophets. The Bible is supernatural. Of course, the Bible prophesied events that have come to pass. We can look at them, but there are Bible, the Bible has also prophesied the end of the world. Now, we may have difficulty in grasping everything, but the chief fact is this. The Bible prophesied the first coming of Messiah in great detail. And, of course, people missed it when it happened, especially the scribes and Bible students. I often think this about the experts on Revelation. 
Yeah, I mean, excepting my book, of course, that's the best book on Revelation. I just mentioned that in passing. But uh, the point is that we have all these books on Revelation. I wonder how many of the scribes will miss it in the end. But the point is, the first coming of Christ, the scribes missed it. And they spent all their time trying to work out when he was coming. But the Bible then prophesied the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible has so many prophecies of the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's why when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he said, this is what was written. This day was prophesied. So you have the coming of Christ, the Messiah, exactly as prophesied. With hindsight, you see it. We have the coming of the Holy Spirit prophesied. And then the way the Holy Spirit works in every generation, so that I can look in my heart and say, you know what? I have received exactly what the Bible prophesied I would receive when the Holy Spirit came. So I'm living in the Bible. And then the Bible prophesies the second coming of Christ, that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, that there will be various events that we will see and that he will come. And uh, the, the, the world will end with the coming of Christ. Now, whatever happens after that, you, you can tell me later what you think. But the point is, the Bible has prophesied the first coming of Christ, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the second coming of Christ. And as you look back in history, you see those prophecies fulfilled. So you know the third one is going to be fulfilled. Um, <clears throat> Another um, whole realm of prophecy is um, archaeological evidence. And um, uh, there are lots of details you could, we could talk about this. Um, I, I love it when, when scientists and archaeologists are forced to say, you know what, the Bible was right. Very reluctantly do they ever say that. <laughs> But it is, it is amazing that the way the, the Bible is proved correct by archaeology. You find references to Hezekiah, to David, and so on. And you find them all over the Middle East. So you find things that, inscriptions that tell us uh, about the invasion of uh, um, um, Israel by Sennacherib this king of Nineveh, uh, and we find out that Hezekiah is mentioned in their writings. And then we find confirmation also about things about Nebuchadnezzar. We find all these writings. And of course, they were. we live in a day when there are more and more archaeological discoveries, all proving the authority and authenticity of the Bible. I love the story of Sir William Ramsey. He was born in the lap of luxury and was raised as a non-believer by atheist parents. He graduated from Oxford University with a PhD. And uh, he then went downhill from there on because he went to Aberdeen. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm sure he went up, uphill. Aberdeen, I'm sure, is much better than Oxford. But the point is, he became a professor and then he determined to undermine the historical accuracy of the Bible. He studied archaeology with the aim of disproving the Bible account. After 25 years of work, Ramsey was awestruck by the accuracy of the Bible. In his quest to refute the Bible, he discovered many facts which confirmed its accuracy. He had to concede that Luke's account in the book of Acts was accurate in the smallest detail. And far from attacking the Bible, he produced a book called St. Paul, The Traveler and Roman Citizen. Eventually, he shook the world, the intellectual world, of the, his day by converting to Christianity. And uh, he, ex he explored the Middle East 
and it led him to faith in Christ. The Bible is true. The greatest thing about the Bible is that it has power to create what it says. So we know that the, this, with this word, it, it tells you in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So here you've got this statement in, the, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, that there is something before the physical world. In the scientific world, the physical world is primary. But in the spiritual world, the word of God is primary. And the physical world is secondary. And that's always going to be the case. So that when we believe the word of God, it will create in us and produce in us exactly what it says. And of course, uh, you get words in the scriptures like Jesus said, it is finished. That was a word that went into the spirit world and changed everything. What was finished? Sin was finished. Death was finished. Satan's power was finished. Why did Jesus see it? No, he said it. When the word is spoken in authority and power, it produces what it says. And that one word, it is finished, if it can be grasped and believed in every heart, as the song says, the, rule, the reign of sin and death is o'er. And all may live from sin set free, not because we get educated by the, the truth of the Bible, but because the word of God is received in faith in our hearts and produces in us, creates in us exactly what it says. The greatest truth in the Bible is that Peter again said, we are born again by the word of God. The living power of the word. And uh, I believe that the, the Bible has its own power in itself. It, 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 again, it must be received in faith. But as soon as it's received in faith, it is life changing. It is as um, Psalm 19 says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. Making wise the simple. And, um, of course, also the Bible, it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we already read Timothy when it says the Bible brings the wisdom needed to find salvation. The whole point about what we're saying is that the the Bible is a book that, if read correctly, will transform the life of the reader. So how do you read it? Well, you read it as it is, believing in its intrinsic power. So you read it with humility. You read it seeking God. You read it with faith. And as we do it, we discover the power of the Bible. It's astonishing that somebody can read the same scripture and uh, have nothing because of pride. I love, love to say that you read the Bible with your ears, not your eyes. You listen, you meditate. And uh, here's a word from a Puritan writer. He said, Reading without meditation is unfruitful. Meditation without reading is hurtful. So we must meditate on the scripture. We don't just think. To meditate and to read without, without prayer upon both is without blessing. So you have the scripture leading to thought and meditation as the Bible 
enjoins us to meditate on the scripture and then to pray and make the scriptures a springboard to launch into God and receive from God. It's a doorway into heaven. So we don't look down at the Bible. We look up at the Bible, seeing through it to the person of God. And uh, we can, we, I believe that a rediscovery of the Bible, not just reading it more, but receiving it and, and meditating in it and rooting ourselves in it is a prelude to revival. I believe that the, um, the Reformation was so powerful because it was a rediscovery of the Bible. And in those days when they had to choose between the Bible and life itself, they, could, they died owning the Bible. Um, in, in communist countries, they tore up Bibles so that they could pass around pages and memorize them. But now we are so, live in such a comfortable, easy world that the Bible can be just neglected. We need to re-embrace the Bible as the foundations of our life. And, um, well, I think that's, that's enough for tonight. But I just... Uh, I, I noticed that I mentioned George Muller. George Muller said that his prayer life was transformed when he realized that his Bible was a springboard to prayer. So he wouldn't start praying. He would start reading the scriptures and claiming the promises of the scripture, taking them as a checkbook. I think that's what Charles Spurgeon called the Bible, a checkbook that he would cash in and said, I claim these promises. And I believe that wherever the Bible is received in the right way, it becomes a, a great springboard for the activity of the Holy Spirit. Uh, may God refresh it in all of us. I, I'm, I've had moments in my life when the Bible has become refreshed in its importance. And um, it's always led to a, tremendous time of blessing and a deepening of my faith and my walk with the Lord. Let me pray and then we'll open it up for others to share and to, uh, I'm sure there'll be others want to share things that they've discovered in their lives. Uh, let's, let's pray. Jesus, I praise you both for the scriptures I have in my hand, but also for this amazing fact that it is life. It's these words. You, you said it. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They are not the dead analytical words of men. They are the life-giving pronouncements of a holy God. And I receive them into my being and I pray, do begin a new in each one of us as we embrace your word with joy and let it have its full effect in us i pray this in jesus name amen